Hello, and welcome to chapter three, how we study development. In this chapter, we will be looking at the following learning questions, and there will be five videos for this chapter. Videos one and two will look at what is the scientific method and how is it used to study development. Videos three and four will look at what are the different types of research designs used to study development? And finally, video five, we'll look at the last two learning questions. You know, what must we consider when we interpret and communicate the results of a study and what precautions or special precautions must, must be taken when children are the research participants. So let's begin with the scientific method. Oh wait, not quite yet. <laughs> Jumping ahead of myself. Okay, before we get to the scientific method, I wanted to make the distinction between basic and applied research. Um, and there is a, a a fair difference between these two areas. So, and 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 they're what they sound like. In basic research, the primary goal is to add to our understanding of phenomena and to help us refine our theories. It is basically about seeking knowledge about how things work, how the brain works and how you know, how humans behave in different circumstances. It, its goal is, you know, end goal is just to learn more about psychology and human behavior and human thinking. Um, it, I was a basic researcher and uh, and I never really gave a thought to how my results would ever be used. I wasn't out to, you know, purposely make the world a better place for, for individuals. I, I was wanting to add to our knowledge and discover things that hadn't been discovered before about, about humans and thinking and behavior. And that's what basic research is all about. Um, you know, is you study a phenomena, you try to find significant results, you publish journal articles and, and present at conferences and you share your knowledge and add to, you know, the, the whole field of knowledge of, of human behavior. Um, in applied research, you have a very different goal. You want to solve immediate problems or improve the human condition. So applied researchers have a, you know, they, they have like a subject population in mind and they, they have, they're doing research in order to try to improve conditions for certain populations. And um, applied researchers may often use the results from basic research. So basic researchers are discovering things um, about human thinking and behavior. And often the applied researchers are applying those results to, to help others. And so very two very different areas and, it, and most researchers don't really do both. They, you, you they, researchers tend to be in one area or the other. Okay. But they're certainly connected, obviously. They, they, the information is shared between the two areas from basic research to, to applied research. Okay, now we'll get to the scientific method. Um, and in the scientific method, it was just, um, start at the top there and then do you, you you originally make some maybe you make some observations of, uh, about a behavior and and you say hmm that's interesting um, and you formulate a hypothesis about about the behavior so a hypothesis is is like a it's a prediction basically or you know you can think of it as a prediction or a question Oh, maybe I was at a playground and there was a bunch of young children there. Um, maybe they were kindergarten children and, and you know, all around like five years old. And it, and it seemed, it appeared to me that the five-year-old girls were more aggressive than the five-year-old boys. And I might say to myself, hmm, that's interesting. I, I never would have thought that maybe there's something about this age that, that makes girls more aggressive than boys. And by the way, I'm just creating an example to use, you know, to, to, to describe things, a hypothetical example. Um, 
And so, so I might think, hmm, maybe, maybe there's a reason for this. And so I might formulate a hypothesis just that I believe or predict that, that five-year-old girls will tend to be more aggressive than five-year-old boys. And it might just be based on, you know, some initial observations I, I made. And so I want to, I want to test that hypothesis. And so I, for, I, I, I create the hypothesis. I, I, I um, define exactly what, what my question is and what I'm searching for. And then I operationalize my concepts. We'll get into that a little bit later. It's, it just means defining the concepts that you're using in your in your study. You choose a research method, you know, the, and we'll be covering all these steps as we go through this chapter. Um, choose a research method, then there's different methods you can use. You might use a correlational study or an experiment or a special developmental design. Um, you select a representative sample. You want a, a sample that represents the population. Um, you conduct your test, however, whatever measurement you've decided to 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 use. Um, you know, in in order to measure aggression, there, there's different ways I could do it. You know, I might just have observers watch children in a playground and 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 you know make little check marks on on a on a notepad. Uh, I interpret the results once all the data has been collected. And interpreting the results, you know, involves statistical programs, and um, and it, it it you know tells you precisely whether the result you you know if you found a result that is is statistically significant or not. Um, if if the results are interesting and you have a statistically significant result, meaning that you know you did find something that where one group was different than the other, then then you you would probably want to disseminate that information. You may publish a paper or just or present at a conference. And and then you would, you know, refine your theory. Um, perhaps things didn't work exactly as you as you originally predicted. And you might, you know, adjust your theory and then and then you kind of start over and, and you say, okay, maybe I'll 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 do it a little bit differently this time, or I'll change my prediction a little bit. And, and you kind of cycle through this. I mean, it. We often read about experimental results in, in textbooks, and and um, and you might get the impression you know people run experiments and then they publish the results. I mean, you know, the the truth is you probably run five or ten experiments before you ever publish results. I mean, because you you're cycling through this, um, and you're refining your your experimental conditions, you're refining your predictions. Uh, before you're really ready to finally publish and, and that you have like a really solid result. So it's, it's most, the majority of experiments are, are not shared or published. The majority of them, you know, are, are, are just leading the researcher to, to refine and, and to start and kind of start again. It can be frustrating at times, let me tell you. Okay, let's go on. So we're going to go through a lot of those steps. And um, one of the first ones is to develop a hypothesis as I mentioned, a hypothesis is a prediction or a question, often based upon theoretical ideas or observations, and it's tested by the scientific method. Sometimes a hypothesis comes directly from an, from an existing theory. So perhaps, you know, it could be, you know, some other, some other researcher published a theory and, and I read their theory and I look at it and I say, hmm, if that theory's true, then this should be true, you know, like, and so um, a theory often leads to many specific predictions or many specific hypotheses. So after any kind of major theories published, people often test, you know, uh, the predictions that come from that theory uh, by developing specific hypotheses. So just to make it clear is, is a theory is, is a bigger you know, uh, construction than, than a hypothesis. hypothesis. Hypothesis is a single question or prediction. You can often answer the, the, that question or, or prediction like in a single experiment or, or a couple of experiments. A, a theory, on the other hand, is made up of many results, many past, re, past experimental results. It's kind of a, it's a, like a larger construction linking together different ideas. You know, maybe you're linking ideas from 10 different experimenters 
that published results in the past. And you say, these all fit together in this way. So a theory is a much larger construction than, than a, a single hypothesis. So don't, so if, you know, if somebody says, what's a hypothesis? It, you definitely don't say, say it's a theory. I mean, hypothesis is one little question coming from a theory. Okay, you don't have to develop your hypothesis from a it can just be as simple as coming observations, as in my example, I witnessed something and it made me think maybe this is always true. And, and so, you know, there's not necessarily a theory, but it, it, it may just be something, something a question that I, I developed that I, I don't know the answer to. Okay, operational, operationalizing concepts is very, very important. When you begin any study, it's defining, precisely defining a concept in a way that allows it to be measured. And, um, and so like take the example of, of aggression. So I may be, you know, I mentioned maybe I'm studying aggression in five-year-old girls versus five-year-old boys. I mean, what's my definition of aggression? I mean, is it aggression that if one kid calls another kid a name? I mean, is that aggression? Do they have to hit each other? What if one tries to hit each other and, and they're like two feet away and they don't even come close? Is, is that aggression? What if somebody, you know, um, tries to turn uh, friends against a person, you know, uh, you know, and they, they tell their, they tell, let's say other classmates, uh, don't be friends with this person. And then maybe they spread rumors about them. Is that aggression? We call that relational aggression. There's verbal aggression. There's physical aggression. You have to decide what types of aggression are you studying in any, if you were interested in aggression, you can't, you can't just say aggression. And then you have to not only decide which types, you know, physical, verbal, relational, but you, you then also have to precisely define exactly how you're going to measure it. If is physical, is it, does it count as physical aggression? If somebody, you know, tries to hit somebody, but they completely miss, I mean, probably maybe, you know, if it looks like they intended to, but, but you have to define that. Um, okay. And, and it should be well enough to find that's defined that somebody else could read your oper operationalized definitions and, and, you know, repeat the study the same way you measured aggression or whatever your variable is. Um, when we're deciding on how to measure our, our variables of interest, Two concepts that are very important are reliability and validity. And reliability, as it says here, is the ability of a measure to produce consistent results. So whatever your measuring device is, and when I say device, I mean measuring device could be an observational checklist. It could be a physiological measure. You might be re re recording somebody's uh, heart rate, you know, and seeing how it changes when they're under stress. I mean, so it could be physiological in nature. It could be a written test, like an IQ test is a, is a measuring device. So when we, so it's, it's a very broad term, like you have to make sure that your measuring de device can produce consistent results, however it is you're measuring something. So there's a couple of ways we, we check for reliability. And one is inter-rater reliability inter-rater reliability. And that's established with, when, when you have more than one observer that looks at the same behavior and they, they, and they get the same results. And so this is, for observational type studies, this is, you often do it this way. If I was gonna record aggression among children, young children playing, I would want two observers, you know, recording the same kinds of behaviors. And you know, and it's because sometimes it can be very difficult to, they might be giving ratings to level of aggressions like on a seven point scale. And, and so like if one of them gives it a behavior a rating of six and the other one gives it a rating of three, you know, there's something wrong. You haven't, you know, defined the terms well enough or, so you, what you do is when you have two observers, you can do a statistical comparison of their ratings and see that they match up well enough. So you, you know, you, you expect them to be, they don't have to be perfectly matched but there, you know, there's a certain acceptable rate uh, that they have to be within um, of each other to say that 
that um, the, the measuring device is working. A second way we, we test reliability is, is test, retest reliability. Test, retest reliability. And this is when the same participants get the same, you know, they get, they get tested on the, on the same measuring device on more than one occasion, and you hope that they get, you know, approximately the same results. And so this is used for things like, let's say an IQ test, for instance. If I give you an IQ test today, can I give you the same IQ test, I don't know, let's just say three months from now or a half year from now, the results should be, you know, fairly similar, you know, uh, provided that there, you know, there aren't some questions that were really memorable that you just completely remembered. But, but especially, you know, if you didn't know you were going to be tested again, you probably wouldn't even try to remember the questions. Anyways, what we know is that IQ doesn't change, you know, uh, uh, very quickly. I mean, if, if, if at all, I mean, it, it's something that changes very slowly over years. And so like a half year from now, your IQ should be the same as it is today or very close. And so if my measuring device actually measures IQ, my IQ test, then I should get about the same result each time. Once again, it doesn't have to be exact, but we can measure like how close the two sets of results are. You know, we would have a subject do the test two times and we compare the, the scores from one time to another. So that's test, retest reliability. So both of these are ways to test, you know, is this reliability measure working or is it responding to like day-to-day -day conditions? I mean, some tests are sensitive to moods and things like that. And so it changes from one week to another. I mean, that's not a reliable test. You, know, you can never trust the results. Okay, validity is the second important concept when you're choosing variables and operationalizing them. It's the ability of a measure to accurately measure what it purports to. So validity, it just basically means that like, if I say my, this test measures IQ, I need to see, is it really measuring IQ? I mean, it, just because I say it's an IQ test, and I put like some questions that, you know, uh, smarter people will, will do better on. I mean, like, you know, just, if, you know, who knows what, if, is it really measuring IQ? Maybe it's just measuring, you know, um, not current knowledge, or maybe it's just measuring, you know, like, you know, who has a better vocabulary. I mean, things that aren't necessarily IQ. And so with, for validity, you, you often need to compare, you, you, should, you, you would expect your results to transfer to other things where IQ should be important. So let me just give you an example, like SAT scores, they're supposed to be predictive of, of how somebody's gonna do in college. So to test the, the validity of SAT scores, they compare them to first year college GPAs. And you would expect that people that do better on the SAT should do better in college. And, and it matches up pretty well. It really is predictive. That means we can consider the SAT a valid measure of, of somebody's aptitude for college because people that score better, you know, tend to do better in college. So you, you look for a way to see if your, result, if your results are confirmed using some other measure to see if they're valid. Um, okay. I mean, it's, think about something like a lie detector test. I mean, to test the validity, you, you could have somebody come in and, you know, and, and just try to trick you and tell lies some of the time, tell truths some of the time and just, and you know, if it's valid, I should be able to re figure out which ones are lies and which ones are truths. You know, so the, there are different ways you test validity of measuring devices. Okay, finally, in this first video, sampling and representative samples. Okay, the population is everyone in the category we're interested in studying or learning about more about. So when I talked about five-year-old girls and boys and their aggression levels, I mean, my population was, you know, uh, five-year-old children, five-year-old boys and girls. And, and, I, and specifically, I would say five-year-old boys and girls within the U United States. I wouldn't think my results would necessarily transfer to other, other countries, uh, particularly from an individualistic society, let's say to a collectivist society. So, so you have to define, you know, how, what's kind of, how far do you, or do you think your results are going to stretch? Like what, what is your whole population you're interested in? And then you, you want to select a representative sample from that population. 
something, a sample that reflects the characteristics of the population. So if my population includes different races, my sample should have different races. It wouldn't make sense to um, have all um, non-Hispanic white Caucasians if, I, if I'm saying my results transfer to other races as well. Similarly, I couldn't just test all males if I say my, my results should generalize to females as well. I, I better have females in my, in my sample as well. So like, you wanna make sure you, know, you have a mix of, of your population in your sample. Okay, and um, that is the first video. In the, in the next video, we'll, we'll look at some different ways that we collect data.